the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. A vision given during troubled times to the people of Jerusalem living under the imminent threat of invasion. In uh, 701, the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, uh, Sargon's son, came over with his army and invaded the kingdom of Judah. We know from the Assyrian sources that they destroyed 46 of the cities of Judah. According to the vision, the Lord was trying to get the attention of a nation that had turned their backs on what he had said in the Torah and on him. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The vision expressed both warnings and hope for Isaiah's time, while including predictions that reached to the end of the age. But there was one part of the vision that sounded different, totally unexpected, a mysterious prophecy tucked in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. In graphic detail, it spoke of a servant, a servant deliverer, whose identity seemed hidden in a kind of prophetic riddle. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. For centuries, many have tried to solve the mystery of Isaiah chapter 53 and identify this one whom the Lord calls my servant. In the ancient Targum, which is a rabbinic paraphrase of the Bible, it says, behold, my servant, the Messiah, and it adds the words, the Messiah, will prosper. And so it is actually uh, thinking of Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, it says, this is the Messiah. So many, many passages, many uh, citations could say, yes, this was a messianic passage. Behold my servant. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Many were astonished at you. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He was despised and rejected by men. From ancient times, Jewish interpreters understood Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12 to be a messianic passage. For example, in the Talmud, in Sanhedrin 98, it speaks of the Messiah. It asks the question, what is the Messiah's name? And it says, the sick one, for he shall bear our sicknesses, quoting from Isaiah, from Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and with his wounds, we are healed. The Jewish view that's always made the most sense to me in this has been to argue for the righteous remnant as a f uh, function of the collective as opposed to Israel as a whole, because we know Israel's history as a, as a whole is not particularly righteous. So the nation as a whole doesn't qualify, but the idea that within Israel there are certain righteous ones who have faithfully represented God who could perhaps fit this role seems to me to be a plausible way to try and make the, the corporate argument. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This much we see, beginning in the 41st chapter, Israel is referred to as the servant of the Lord as a nation. But then sometimes one individual within the nation is identified as the servant. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. It says that the servant dies for the sins of my people. Now, whether it's Israel speaking, God speaking, or Isaiah speaking, the only answer to the question of who are my people is, it's Israel. 
So how could Israel die for Israel as a substitution? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. So the unnamed servant succeeds and conquers, not by power, but by surrender and suffering bringing healing for his people, the Jewish people, and the world. But who is this suffering servant? When you come to Isaiah 53, you have to ask yourself, who actually fulfilled this? Who actually died, and his own people thought he was dying for his sin, and yet he was dying for the sins of the whole world? Who was it that didn't defend himself, that went as a lamb to the slaughter, who was it that not only was cut off from the land of the living and died, but then continued on, saw the light of life, continued alive? Who was it that bore the sin of many? Who was it because of whom kings of the earth have shut their mouths in awe and said, we never knew, we never understood? For centuries, the rabbis of Israel reflected on the mysteries of what Isaiah had foreseen. Some suggested that Isaiah was predicting two messiahs, two deliverers, one in the military legacy of King David, another who, like the patriarch Joseph, would rescue his people through suffering. Messiah, son of David, and Messiah, son of Joseph. Then, just as the modern nation of Israel was being reborn, the prophecies of Isaiah resurfaced. Ancient copies of the prophet, dated 100 years or more before the Christian era, were discovered at the lowest spot on earth, near the Dead Sea. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are ancient Jewish manuscripts discovered between 47 and 56 in 11 caves in the area of Qumran. Qumran is located on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea, 25, 30 kilometers east from Jerusalem. This was one of the greatest and most important discoveries uh, of uh, antiquities ever made. Here, the air is bone dry, perfect for preserving and hiding the manuscripts of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Many scholars identify what remains of the Qumran community with a Jewish sect called the Essenes. Seeing the priesthood and temple worship of Jerusalem as being corrupted, the Essenes broke from mainstream Judaism and retreated here to seek the Lord in the wilderness. It seems that the book of Isaiah uh, was among the most popular and most admired uh, books uh, for the sect uh, which was uh, living at Qumran during Second uh, Temple period. And of the book of Isaiah, we have 21 copies. Isaiah is the most popular prophet among the Dead Sea Scrolls. He's the off-quoted prophet in all the scrolls. And it's a fact that out of the 220 biblical copies in, in, in Qumran, the only full copy is the great Isaiah scroll discovered in Cave 1 in 47. So it's very obvious that must be a reason, hmm? uh, because Isaiah is a key prophet in Qumran. The Essenes carefully copied biblical texts and community documents. Their desert library reflected the belief that they were living in the times of Israel's long-awaited Messiah. And there are many examples in the book of Isaiah, in the oracles of the Isaiah prophet, about uh, the future uh, Savior and the, the end of history. In the uh first century BC, first century AD, those uh, people probably felt their own days as the very uh, troublesome 
days of uh, prophet Isaiah. They regarded the uh, Roman threat uh, to be maybe parallel to the threat felt by the Jerusalemites from Assyria, the great power of their time. They regarded themselves as the Isaiah of their own time. Some groups like the Qumranites and the, the, the group of uh, Jesus and John the Baptist, they live uh, with the sense that uh, actually uh, they are on the eve of the new era, hmm? expecting the, uh, the Messianic kingdom. It's quite obvious why Isaiah became a key prophet for disclosing the secret of time. The secret of the times. In scrolls governing life and worship called the community rule, the Essenes used the words of Isaiah to describe their messianic mission to, quote, open up a path for the Lord. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And this issue is a key issue mentioned in the scrolls themselves in the community rule and it's not by chance that the same verse, quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, is the same verse also uh, mentioned in the context of John the Baptist, in the Gospel of Mark and the parallels. Also, strictly speaking, this verse is mentioned explaining why John the Baptist is announcing the coming of the Messiah in the wilderness of Judea. So, again, it can't be by chance that same verse is quoted, and again, it teaches the fact that uh, the prophet Isaiah was a key prophet for different groups in ancient Judaism. Soon after John the Baptist called on his people to prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, Isaiah's predictions of a suffering servant took a controversial turn. Followers of Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew, came to the conclusion that they had seen an unexpected and dramatic fulfillment of the ancient words in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. The shrine of the book at the Israel Museum houses the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit. Showcased here is a replica of the Great Scroll of Isaiah, 1,000 years older than any previously discovered copies of the prophet. Here, a national treasure silently represents the hope of a nation and a promise for the world. Within this 24-foot scroll are ancient predictions of a restored people and of a global peace. It is a day when, as Isaiah says, the lion will lie down with the lamb and swords will be beaten into plows, a time when a long-awaited Messiah reigns in justice. Yet with the promise comes an unfolding drama. The 53rd chapter of this scroll tells the story of the suffering servant deliverer that would eventually be claimed by followers of Jesus. It's important to remember that in the time of Jesus, there was no such thing as Christianity. He was a rabbi, not a reverend. He was called Christ, not because he was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Christ, but because Christ was the Greek way of saying Messiah. And the only Bible they had was what we call the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. According to the Gospels, Jesus and his disciples didn't see themselves as starting a new religion, but part of a new era in Judaism. A new era that would again and again reach back to the promises of prophets like Isaiah. And it's a fact that uh, also, the prophet Isaiah is the oft-quoted prophet in the New Testament writings. Again, it can uh, not be a chance. And there is another and very intriguing issue. There is, in the uh, stories on Jesus in the Gospels, there is only one story in which Jesus is said that he reads from a book. There is only one story in only one version. In the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 4, hmm, we tell the story that when Jesus on Sabbath, on Shabbat, he, 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 he was in Nazareth. Hmm? He was asked to read from a, a scroll, and it was given to Jesus the book of Isaiah, and he read from uh, Isaiah chapter 61 hmm? about the Spirit of God uh, uh, upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. There is a, a big discussion among scholarship if this story can be uh, regarded as a true uh, and original story about Jesus or an apocryphal story. But in any case, it's very obvious that in one way or another, hmm, the story uh, reflects the significance that the prophet Isaiah had for the followers of Jesus, John the Baptist and the first Christians. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8, there's an Ethiopian royal official who is heading back. He's the treasurer. Uh, he's obviously a convert to Judaism, and he's got the scroll of Isaiah in his chariot, and he is reading it, and he's trying to figure out who is this servant. And it's at this point that he meets Philip, uh, who was a Jewish follower of Jesus uh, in the first century, obviously taught by the disciples, had learned of Isaiah 53 and its application to Jesus being the Messiah. And uh, when he meets this royal official, uh, he asks him if he knows who he's reading about. And the royal official says, I don't know. There's no one here to explain it to me. Uh, who is he speaking of? Is he speaking of himself? Is he speaking of, uh, who is he speaking of? And at that point, Philip shows him how Jesus is the fulfillment of this passage, that, it's, that he is the, uh, the, the referent that Isaiah was speaking of when he spoke of the Messiah, the suffering servant. And at this point, the royal official immediately believes and becomes a follower of Jesus as well. What really inspired those close to Jesus? What made them see him as more than another rabbi? After the tragic and unexpected execution of their teacher, followers of Jesus claimed to be eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Before long, they were also seeing, in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, an ancient portrait of the remarkable events they had just witnessed. In verse after verse, they saw detailed descriptions of the life of Jesus, his terrible sacrificial death, and even his resurrection. They saw Jesus as the unnamed suffering servant in the arresting portrait of Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, it's shocking to see the servant of the Lord experiencing, experiencing a humiliating death, a, a horrific death. Uh, when it describes him, it talks about him being crushed for our iniquities. Uh, it, it describes him as being so beaten and so hurt that he's beyond recognition. It is a excruciating, humiliating, disfiguring death that he faces. It also describes him dying through piercing. It says he was pierced through for our iniquities. So it indicates that his death would include piercing. Uh, and the significance of his death is that it wasn't that he was dying because he did something wrong, but it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We each have turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him, the servant, the iniquity of us all, the guilt of us all. In other words, what he is saying is that the servant is dying as a substitution to take the chastisement for our well-being. He is paying the punishment for our sins. His death, in, in effect, is a substitution. He is exchanging his life so that we can be forgiven. This description of the servant reads like it's a person, an individual, and remarkably like the story of Jesus. But traditional Judaism most often identifies the servant as the nation of Israel, who also suffered tragically. If I was reading it as a traditional rabbi, so I'm reading the Hebrew text, but I'm not just reading the text, I'm reading it with the major commentaries. 
And the primary commentaries on my page are going to be some of the commentaries from 11th, 12th, 13th centuries named Rashi and Ibn Ezra and Radak. These men are very important in traditional Judaism. I'm going to be reading it in light of what they say. And they're going to tell me that the servant of the Lord is Israel. And this is speaking of the suffering of the, the Jewish people or the, the righteous remnant, the, the righteous minority within the nation. And this is as we're scattered around the world, as be it the Holocaust, be it Crusades, Inquisitions, whatever we've suffered through the centuries. And this is through our suffering somehow healing comes to the world. And, and then at the end, the Gentile kings, the nations were recognized. <gasps> They were, wow, we thought they were despised and rejected. They were actually suffering for us, and through them, healing has come our way. First century Israel certainly knew about suffering. Jesus wasn't the only one crucified. Some were still looking for a Messiah, a deliverer, someone to free them from Roman occupation, to restore their kingdom. But it had been 400 years of silence, 400 years since there had been a word from the Lord or a prophet to show them the way. Jesus and John the Baptist both enter the scene, but without a word about Roman oppression. Jesus did say, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So it's not surprising that the rabbi from Nazareth didn't meet the expectations of many in Jerusalem. There's no question that the primary Jewish expectation of the Messiah, even among the disciples, would be one who would rule and reign and establish the kingdom and destroy the yoke of Rome and set the Jewish people free and bring the kingdom of God to the earth. That would have been the most common Jewish expectation. By contrast, according to the Gospels of the New Testament, Jesus presented himself humbly as the servant of Isaiah, conquering through surrender and suffering. He does it indirectly, which is how he actually does a lot of things. But he does it you know, by saying that he came to give his life as a ransom for many, which is an allusion to the imagery of this, of this text. He does it at the Last Supper. You know, the Last Supper is kind of like a last will and testament time with his disciples. You say things when you know you're departing uh, to people to, that they'll remember. And so he has this meal, and he, he takes what is, what is Passover, uh, what is the Passover, and changes the imagery uh, and relates it all to himself. And in the midst of doing that, he says, uh, he, he speaks about the blood uh, being shed for, on behalf of the many. And so this is the blood of the new covenant. Uh, and so uh, poured out for you and poured out for the many. Uh, two, we have two versions of these words in the Gospels. But the, the allusion is to Isaiah 53. And, the, and so Jesus is connecting himself with this sacrifice, being this servant. He tells at the same meal in Luke, he tells uh, his disciples that he will be reckoned with the transgressors, which is a passage coming right out of this text. And Jesus took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So according to the Gospels, while anticipating his death, Jesus spoke of that future kingdom foreseen by Isaiah. And earlier in his life, Jesus stated his purpose was to serve and serve as a ransom, again quoting from Isaiah 53. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. However, Jesus didn't just link himself to one prophetic chapter in Isaiah, but to the whole of the Hebrew Bible. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Centuries ago, the prophet wrote of the suffering of a heroic figure called My Servant. Does the mystery still remain? Was that servant a nation that suffered? Was the servant a son of David who said he came to serve and suffer?
all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All prophecies are tested by time.